Isn't one of the issues in China, though, with all of the private collectors there starting museums, the fact that um, it's an exciting moment when these museums open, but in fact they are not particularly uh, planned for in terms of their sustainability. So, I mean, some of the other museums where there's a foundation involved and the family becomes involved and it's, it will continue into the future, as you suggest. But China is another matter, is it not? You know, I'm not sure. I mean, the, I think that the growth in China has been fairly recent in the last five years. And so who knows what will happen? I think that, um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of private museums here in the U.S. that haven't survived See, over this the is years. A, this so, is good, I mean, I just, This you know. is a good opportunity for a plug for the um, for Asian Society's um, Art and uh, Museum Asian Network because in terms of exchanging prof professional practice, if we can help get these museums continuing into the future with the right practices of putting foundation money in place so that the operations can continue it would be a good thing. So we can... I think, uh, you know, the other thing about just some of the, what's going on in China is I was at a World Cities Conference and it was 27 <clears throat> very large cities from across the world and there were a couple of Chinese cities that didn't exist 25 years ago that are enormous cities that the growth uh, and the speed of the growth is just unprecedented. And to try to then weave a museum culture into a brand new idea of what a city could be, mm -hmm. it just seemed like completely foreign to the Europeans, especially at mm -hmm. that conference. It's like, well, we've been around, you know, we're dealing with cultural uh, life of this city that's been evolving for 1,500 mm -hmm. years in place. And they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, 1,500 days ago, you know, <laughs> none of this existed. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think, think it's the different, it's a new. It, yeah, challenge. I mean, I think the economics also are different. I, I, having previously worked outside of the U.S., the U.S. was always seen as a bit of an anomaly in terms of private philanthropy supporting a whole museum infrastructure. It really doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And yet, we see the beginnings of it in a place like China. So I think that, you know, it's really early days, and I think that it may be too quick to actually judge. Um, I think it's kind of extraordinary. In less than a decade, we see major museums. I mean, as a, you know, I mean, in Shanghai alone, you have six new museums in the last kind of eight, eight months. And you know, it's hard to ignore them because it's on a scale of some of the more established museums that we have here. Um, and you know, they're. The staff, the owners, the collectors are all very open to wanting to collaborate and learn. And so, I, you know, I think it's a, um, I think it's a really kind of interesting moment actually, where if you can kind of all come together, and that was part of the kind of making a museum in the 21st century. Okay, so if we start from ground zero, if we start from today, you know, how, how can you build a museum that's relevant in this? fast-changing world and, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's completely different from it would, what it would have been for the Hirshhorn 40 years ago, for example. Mm -hmm. so. um, to the panel in general, there was a lot of talk from everyone regarding the future of how museums are moving forward, connecting with the audience, with architecture, and Mr. Armstrong also commented about um, possibly finding the properly trained animated ways to animate the institution. I'm curious where you see museum education going for the 21st century because, the, Tom, you mentioned arts education in schools and how are we reaching visitors in a different way? There's been a lot of change at the Hirshhorn, I know, and just curious where you guys see that going. Well, I think there'll be a, a more wholesale incorporation of technology. Our, the app that we have today is something that we couldn't have imagined two years ago. And uh, there'll be, I think, a further integration of, you know, mnemonic devices that are kind of technological. I think uh, if we're able to, if the new teachers are successful, we're able to reintroduce another generation to creative possibilities, our attendance will change, I hope, the demographic of our attendance. But we've had, you know, 25 very bleak years, I would say in the public schools yeah, here. Yeah. And not just in New York, but elsewhere also. So I wanted to say something that is extremely annoying to my wife and to other curators. And I see Green Susan Curator is here also, <coughs> um, which is related to your question in relationship to, to, between education, let's say, and museums. 
is that I think that the avant-garde in museums is shifting to the education department. That there's this gatekeeping strategy in curatorial, which is figuring out how many people you can keep out of the doors, right? And that the strategy in education is how many people can you invite in? And how many different kinds of people? And how many different uh, approaches are available? Now, this, of course, there are exceptions. But I, I, you know, and again, my wife's a curator, and I love curators as well. But I do feel that there is uh, a shift, uh, a, a paradigm shift happening in museums that are capable of understanding that shift. 